any kind of ism, consumerism or whatever kind, any kind of ism will lead to a certain mindlessness. So mindless consumerism is definitely not towards human well-being. The advertising industry should focus on creating conscious consumer rather than mindless consumerism. Because uh, consumption used to be a disease, you know. <laughs> so even now it's a kind of an ailment. That is, we will not do… in our lives we will not do what's needed. We will do what is expected from somebody. This means your life completely derails. People who expect whatever they expect out of you, they themselves do not know a damn thing about their lives. <laughs> to fulfill their expectations, if you live, obviously you will completely go off the track. So I feel uh, the industry should focus on creating a more conscious consumer and a more conscious every kind. <laughs> Ism means a certain mindlessness, simply doing something. Once this sets into a society, a mindless society will go in cycles, not really getting anywhere. Nothing profound will live in that society. Everything becomes profane. Right now, we are rapidly trying to go there. This is a nation, this is a culture where every aspect of life, simple or otherwise, Everything had a deeper rooting, everything had always a deeper meaning. Simple things, how to sit, how to stand, how to eat, everything always had a deeper connotation. Because of this, no matter what kind of rigors outside situation offered us in, f in the form of invasions, in the form of exterminations of certain kind, famines, whatever came, the spirit of India lived on undisturbed because of a very deep rooting. If you take away this deeper rooting in a human being and make him very, uh, you know, somebody who, who lives out of a mall, these people will get shattered very easily. You must understand this, till recently, till last twenty, twenty-five years, twenty years I would say, the number of people who are psychologically deranged in this country is extremely low. I know there are a whole lot of argument and debates, oh that is because it's not recorded, that is because it is not documented. That is also a fact, undeniably it is there. But still for one billion people, how many people are psychologically deranged is extremely small simply because of this more deeper rooting into every simple thing has a deeper meaning and a deeper possibility. Today, uh, because he brought up the issue of women and children and whatever, the statistics say that forty-two percent of women in United States of America over forty-five years of age are all on antidepressants. If you take away a few medical formulations from the market, half the population will go crazy, that's what it means. That's not a healthy society. In many ways, that is a product of mindless consumerism, that is. After having seen that happening to one society, if we do not learn from that, we for sure mindless. Whatever kind of ism you follow, Ism means mindlessness. It's very important that uh, human societies function out of their intelligence, not just out of external tendencies that are going on right now. They will come and go home. There will be a certain segment of society which does that. But pushing the larger segment of society into that kind of a mode clearly shows we are not interested in the well-being of human beings. We just want to sell something at any cost. And above all, if you go by consumerism, the only way you can sustain this is you're determined to keep one half of the population 
in abject poverty. Because if 7.2 billion people who live on this planet have to have a life in terms of consumerism, an average American citizen has, the living earth statistics says that we need four and a half planets to sustain this. We only have half a planet left, one half is already taken. With half a planet, you're marketing for four and a half planets. This is a dangerous process. The only way you can do this is one half of the population should be kept in abject poverty so that others can go in consumerism binge. I think uh, a more sensible way of living is possible. This does not mean you do not enjoy your life, this does not mean you have… don't have things. Everybody can have what they need. Everybody can have what they can use, but just for the sake of satisfying somebody else's opinion who himself is mindless, if you go about digging up the planet because whether you take a phone or a car or a spacecraft, you can only dig it out of this planet. We're going to dig the Mars, that's different, but <laughs> right now, whether you make a safety pin or the biggest machine on the planet, you have to dig the earth. I'm not trying to render a, a, an ecological message. I'm talking about human beings. This is like the proverbial a Panchatantra story <coughs> where a man is sitting on the wrong side of the branch and cutting it. If he succeeds, he will fail. That's not good if you succeed if you're going to fail. This is happening. Successful people on the planet, not so much in India yet it will come. In the Western world, the most successful people do not carry the most joyful faces, okay? They carry really tense and agitated faces. So now we are sending out a message to the younger generation, success is suffering. This is a very wrong message. If you do this, what happened in the sixties in America will happen everywhere. The message was so clear that success is not worthwhile. So the younger generation chose, they thought it's better to street, uh, sit on the street side and smoke pot. Definitely, it's at least we're happy. That's the philosophy of the youth. That will come everywhere if you send out this message that success is suffering. Success is the sweetest thing in human life. It doesn't matter whether we do small things or big things, success is the most important thing. If success becomes suffering, if a society gets this message, that society is for sure down the drain society. So consumerism, creating a conscious consumer who can pick and choose what he wants is different, but Mindless consumerism is definitely pushing us in that direction. I would… Uh, I know all the advertising giants are here. I would please request you, in the interest of your children and the future of the nation and the world, it's very important how we promote this. Sir, uh, spiritualism also has an ism at the end. If it's an ism, that is also mindless. <laughs> <laughs> where, where do you see the balance? See, when the ball is set rolling, today I'm sure that if I was to request some of the mothers out here that refrain from pushing your child into this, that, the other, I'm sure all of you will throw me out of your house because the ball has got rolling. There are other students in the class. They want their child to be better than the others. So the question really that is… That they do only till they're twelve years of age. After that, they're doing their own thing <laughs> Uh, true, but I'm, I'm saying that if in a society which around the world is moving in that direction, what are the few suggestions that you would give to people to try and bring that sense of balance that you're talking about? India still largely, the parents are still pushing their children towards a certain educational qualification because survival is still a strong force, except in us. Uh, a thin veneer of society, 
which has gone beyond survival, the larger part of India is still striving for survival. In most families still somehow get to the engineering, get to the medicine, get to I, something because survival. Survival mode is still strong, that should not last forever. But when a conscious mode comes, when survival is not the big issue, when conscious mode comes, at least now there are no compulsions. When survival mode was on, there is a certain compulsion. Everybody became doctors, whether they liked it or not. Everybody becomes IT engineer, whether they like it or not, because survival. But once the survival mode is over, the the blessing of being beyond survival concerns is that you can choose. You want to create another level of compulsiveness, this is madness. This is sheer madness. When survival is in question, everything is by compulsion. The dictates of survival will determine what you should do and what you should not do or what you can do or what you cannot do. Very few will escape that. But once the dictates of survival are gone, you're off the survival mode, this is a time when you should consciously choose. This is not a time to imitate other people. This is not a time to take mass decisions. This is a time individual people can flower. Because the essence of human life is that individual human beings can grow to their full potential. If that doesn't happen, you have degraded the humanity you have taken away the possibility of what those individual human beings could be. Our education systems are still in that mode. These education systems were created so that you could be a cog in the larger machinery of industry or business or whatever they have created. Reducing a human being into a cog who serves a certain machine, is once again only significant as long as survival is in question. Once that's taken care of in a society, it should not exist, but unfortunately we try to fix them into a different machine. When you have children, you must understand, first of all you must understand, children don't belong to you, they don't come from you, they only come through you. You must understand the privilege that another life passes through you and becomes real. You must be always grateful and see it as a privilege. This is not a time to exercise your right of property. It's not your property. An individual human being cannot be your property. It is not for you to fulfill all your unfulfilled dreams through your children. Yes, it is not for you to drive them in any particular way, harness them in any particular way, no. Does it mean to say you just leave them? So the question is, if I don't influence them, somebody else on the street will influence him, somebody else in the school will influence him, so better I influence him. In terms of… Uh, the best thing you could do with your children is… It's okay, we're going off the advertising track. Are you still there? Okay. <laughs> We'll come <laughs> back to that. When you… Uh, <clears throat> when you have children, one thing is, the moment a child arrives, a whole lot of parents think it's time to teach. <laughs> I want to ask you a simple question. Between you and your child, if the child is below ten years of age, between you and your child, who is more joyful, you or the child? <laughs> the child. Then you please tell me, who should be a consultant for life? <laughs> the miserable one or the joyful one? <laughs> so in the process of so-called growing up, people have become so rigid, they smile once in five days. <laughs> Laughter happens uh, when they get drunk only. <laughs> only drunken laughter you hear, you don't hear simple joyful laughter <laughs> in many places. <laughs> so they have become like this. When a child comes unknowingly, without knowing why, you laugh, you crawl under the sofa, 
you do this and that, you learn to throw a ball properly <laughs> You do things, l things which concern life, which you would have never done by yourself, simply because this bundle of joy has arrived in your family and it's a privilege. It's not for you to shape it and twist it and make it like you or not make it like you. Your business is only to protect it from every influence. This is the best thing you can do. <coughs> People keep asking me, Sadhguru, how is it that a whole range of things you can do and you know, how is it? So the thing is, I remained uneducated. It's not an easy task, I want you to understand. <laughs> because from the first moment you're born, your parents, teachers, adults, just about everybody in the world is trying to teach you a whole lot of things that never worked in their lives. <laughs> yes. They're even telling you where God lives, his address, his ch children's names, his birthday, everything they know, but they don't know a damn thing about themselves. So, a whole lot of things. If you can keep your child just the way he was born, an active intelligence, no conclusions, you would do the best thing for him, believe me. But he won't agree because he would like to influence him <laughs> with his advertisement. <laughs> I only have dogs, sir, and uh, That's they don't listen to me anyway, <laughs> so, so I'm fine. <laughs> you, you spoke about survival. Now, there's a very… Uh, Difficult thing, where do you draw the line between survival and consumerism? Like for instance, uh, in our country, there's a whole lot of emerging rural middle class. Where do they draw the line? They're looking at you, they're looking at your cards. They're... So how do you, where do you draw the line, what is survival? I think it was survival when a man lived in a cave, then he wanted some more air so he made a window then slowly he made a garden, then he made bedrooms and bathrooms. Where does it end? Now, do you call it consumerism or do you call it betterment of lifestyle or where does it stop? I don't know. See, right now our standards have become like this. Everybody wants to do what America does. If all the Americans put carbon dioxide in their water and drink it. Everybody drinks it and says, oh, this is the real thing <laughs> Even a kindergarten child knows this body does well with oxygen, not with carbon dioxide. If all the Americans wear only blue trousers, everybody in the world, across the world in blue trousers, if all, if all the <laughs> if all the Americans tear their pants in their knees, everybody tears their pants in their knees and walks around. So knowingly or unknowingly, we have promoted America to a leadership position. So because we're just imitating that, we need to understand America evolved as a nation in a completely different kind of geography, in a different kind of atmosphere. The people who went as the first, today they called as of uh, what, the fathers of, founding fathers or whatever. These were not the elite of United Kingdom, these were not the most educated. People who were treated very badly, segregated in many ways, who, who could not have a good life here, risked their lives to go across the oceans, it's not like today, a few hundred years ago, Going at across Atlantic is as good as leaving the world. People took that risk because the life here was so bad and so without possibility. So when these people went, the first thing is they saw a lush, limitless land. For somebody who lived on a small island, America, North America is a limitless amount of land. So they went and the only way was to splurge everything from water to land, agriculture, everything that they built, they built super size because they were just working out their poverty states that they had there. This happens in every society, but unfortunately that culture grew in the same way and the whole world is taking to it. 
Is it right or wrong? I am not questioning the morality of it, I am only questioning the practicality of it. I am not saying which is right, which is wrong. Everybody can live whichever way they want. So if all of us want to live whichever way we want, at least we must have this much. In the beginning of twentieth century, we were only 1.6 billion people. Today, we are 7.2 billion people. The United Nations predicts that by 2050, we'll be 9.6 billion people. If we really want to splurge and do whatever we want, at least we must reduce our population. As a generation, if you do not produce children, at least that way, you can do your consumerism whatever you want. You want billions of people to grow and then consume, this is suicide. There's nothing else but suicide. So, instead of leaving it to the predictions and saying by 2050 we'll be close to ten billion people, if we consciously aim, by 2050 we'll be 3.5 billion people, not by killing anybody, just by postponing the reproduction process. If you do that, you, do, you don't have to express so much concern about what individual people are doing. And another thing is, if people are little, there is more space in the world, the need to imitate somebody will be much less. This is happening because we are all cramped up in one place. What somebody does immediately affects us and suddenly we look high or low. So we have to upgrade our stuff too, immediately. If there was little more space, you will see the whole consumerism process will come down. There is all packed up in cities like this, in one apartment house if there are five hundred people living, if one kid carries this one, everybody wants to carry that one. Little more space would do that, but that space is only possible if you work on the population. Right now, this whole discussion, we are trying to work on human aspirations. We will never succeed, this is only I'm talking, but we will never succeed. You cannot control human aspirations, but you can control human populations, for sure. Now, uh, I think a lot of us um, are confronted with this kind of question very often by more evolved people that advertising actually promotes consumerism. What is your take on that? Because I, I personally believe if somebody is making something and somebody is willing to buy something, then we are doing a fairly good job. I, I don't believe uh, advertising is the basis of consumerism. Probably a sensible advertising definitely creates a conscious consumer. Maybe, I don't know much about this, looking at the… I only look at the news channels. So looking at the advertising process in the news channels, I would say only about fifteen to twenty percent is kind of mindless pushing people towards something, others are more trying to create a choice that one can choose. Uh, fifteen percent is not going to be so corrupting. At least one something is fifteen percent for us, it used to be commission earlier <laughs> uh, Now coming to advertising, you are a master communicator yourself and I think it's our opportunity for you, uh, for us to um, hear your views because you actually don't even have a physical product and yet there are millions who are running after you to get to know you're a master communicator. I at least can say, hello, would you like my specs? See, nice specs, better than that one's. So I, I've got something to sell. You have nothing tangible, physical, not, not tangible, but the physical. <laughs> I appreciate the correction. <laughs> so brilliantly. Now, where I am relating this question to our part of the world is that there is… I have a point of view on that how you say it is as important as what you say. Whereas in our business, there are many people, particularly clients, please listen carefully, uh, <laughs> who are only interested in the, the what and they say, okay, why don't you reduce this scenario? This is not selling the product. Whereas 
some of us believe out here that the how is more as important, if not more important than the what. Now, you have said so many things and said them so beautifully. You are a master storyteller. So can we hear your views on the what and the how? Can I tell, you, can I tell you a story? Lovely. <laughs> <clears throat> Shankaran Pillai <laughs> I had been warned <laughs> Shankaran Pillai was a compulsive bridge player. Every day in the evening, he and four of his friends gathered and every day they played bridge. And they played for money, some stakes, and that day the stakes went up one of the friends in a single hand lo lost a thousand dollars and in two minutes he clutched his heart, had a heart attack, fell there, right there and died. So all the remaining four friends stood up, they played the game standing out of respect for the departed friend. <laughs> Then after the game was over, now somebody has to convey this news to his wife. So nobody wanted to do this, so they picked lots. And then Shankaran Pillai got the thing. They picked the cards and he got it, so he had to go. They said, see, you have to do this well. You have to do this really discreetly. This is not like you just go and say, you, your husband is dead. You cannot say that, you have to say it properly. Shankaran Pillai said, don't worry, I'm… I'm really discretion itself, I'm the embodiment of discretion. You don't worry about me. So he went, went home and knocked on the door. The wife came and she opened the door with the security chain and asked, what? Aggressive. He said, uh, you know, I am a friend of your husband, all the more, what? So he said, uh, your husband lost a thousand dollars in a single hand today. She screamed at him, ask him to drop dead, I will convey the message to him. <laughs> That's fantastic <laughs> So now, uh, how you say it is most important. It's more important than what you say many times because what you say, even if it's the most profound thing, can be misunderstood and distorted in no time in other people's minds. Great things have caused enormous damage to people and to larger humanity simply because of the way it's been said. The religions of the world have caused much damage to humanity, much bloodshed and much pain, more pain than anything else on the planet probably, simply because of the way it's been said. What has been said is not really the problem. The way it's been said has caused all this pain and suffering. So how you say it is extremely important. First of all, we need to understand when we say something, if you speak, whether you are in the advertising business or otherwise, if you speak, you must… if you make it this way, that your speech is about the people or the person that you're talking to right now, it's not about you. If you are a compulsive speaker, that you must speak, then it's a different kind of ailment. <laughs> but if you are… If you say, I'm communicating, what does it mean? It's about the person, the way they get it, not about the way I say it. The way they're going to get it is most important. So if you understand this one thing, whenever you speak, it is always about the person who is sitting in front of you, it's not about you, then you will say it well. <laughs> I, I 
wanted to hear it from you, but they don't listen to me. <laughs> that, that brings me to uh, on, on the how. In our business, how is actually the area of emotions and the product is the area of practical. I, I've actually read something. If tears of love, joy and ecstasy have not washed your cheeks, you are yet to taste life. I want you to elaborate on that, the role of emotion, the how in communication. If you, uh, right now if you're walking out of the hall and if you see somebody standing there, tears coming, the normal uh, conclusion in a society like this would be, maybe they're suffering something, some pain, some suffering. Tears and pain have gotten too linked up in most societies. Tears have nothing to do with pain. If any experience of life becomes truly intense, tears will come. But for most human beings, the deepest experience that they have is pain. So they have linked pain and tears together. If you become very joyful, tears will come. If you become very loving, tears will come. Ecstasy will bring tears. Even anger brings tears. Shame brings tears. If anything crosses a certain level of intensity of experience, if you just look at something, if a visual image without any emotion is very intense, tears will come. It is not necessary, there must be an emotion behind it. It is the intensity which brings tears. If you have not known life in its as much intensity as possible, if life has not overwhelmed you, what the hell, what are you doing here? If life and the process of life does not overwhelm you, why are we alive really? If aliveness has touched you, you will see, if you, if you sit in a certain state of meditativeness, just the peacefulness. If you sit for two hours, two hours it will be just going. It is not because of any emotion, just the intensity of peacefulness. But for most people, their love, their joy, their peacefulness is never so intense, but their pain is intense. If you just prick yourself with a pin, it goes to the core. But the joy and other things never t touch like that because that is how people have structured themselves. This is what needs to change. Are you here to experience life or are you here to avoid life? This is a question. With the, there are two fundamental forces that are constantly working within a human being. One is the instinct of self-preservation which is always telling you to put a strong boundary around yourself so that nobody can hurt you and harm you and whatever else. Another is constantly wanting to expand. <coughs> Every human being wants to expand limitlessly. <clears throat> they may not admit it right now. They say just one more thing, if it happens everything will be fine. If that one thing happens, there will always be one more thing and one more thing. They believe in going towards the infinite in installments. Approaching the infinite in installments is a hopeless method. It is never going to happen. You cannot count one, two, three, four, five and one day say it's infinite. Such a possibility does not arise. If you want to approach the infinite, you must give up the one, two, three, four, five. But the security of one, two, three, four, five keeps people like this. This is a mode where you have gotten into your mode as to how to avoid life because some experience of life, your own or somebody else's, has brought pain. So the best thing is to insulate yourself from life itself because life is the source of pain. You will notice this if at any time, I've seen people, I've never had a first-hand experience of these things fortunately <laughs> because this has always been my problem. My parents, my father always worried. He would say, what will happen to this boy? He has no fear in his heart. I never thought fear was a virtue. 
Why is fear, fear a virtue? <coughs> fear is the most debilitating emotion that a human being can go through, but that is considered a virtue. Even if you say divine, even if you say God, you become God-fearing, isn't it? Because somebody is out there to do something to you all the time. So we have thought fear will make life safe. No, the only thing that makes your life safe is your sense, not fear. Fear will avoid life. If you become fearful, the first thing that happens to you is you become breathless because the boundary that you have established is so effective now, even to breathe it becomes difficult. You're in a cubicle where you cannot breathe by yourself. The first sign of paranoia is always breathlessness because if you have to live, you have to transact. What the tree exhales, you must inhale. What you exhale, the tree must inhale. The person, maybe your mother-in-law is sitting next to you, you hate her, but what she exhales, you must inhale. Otherwise, it's not going to work. These boundaries are there only in your psychological space. The life space is not like that. Today modern physics is telling you, as you sit here, every subatomic particle in this body is reverberating with everything else in the cosmos. It is no more a philosophy, it is an established science. And this is something that we have always known when we utter the word yoga, because most of the yoga that you're seeing today in India is a rebound from the American coast. So yoga means contorting your body in some impossible physical posture. No, the word yoga means union. You experientially know that this existence is happening as one whole enormous process. So there's one dimension of you which is instinct of self-preservation which wants to draw boundaries, another dimension wants to limitlessly expand. Are these two things against each other, contradict each other? No. One is concerned with the physicality, the other is concerned with the remaining part of who you are, whatever that is. Only the physical needs a boundary. In fact, the fundamentals of physicality is a defined boundary. You can call this a physical body only because it has a boundary. If I remove the boundaries of this body, you cannot call it physical anymore because the fundamental and the basis of physicality is a defined boundary. But there is something within you which is always longing to be little more than who you are right now. Yes or no? Whoever you may be, how much ever you might have achieved, you want to be little more than who you are right now. Your currencies may be different. One person may be looking for fame, another person may be looking for money, another person for wealth, love, knowledge, whatever. But everybody wants to be something more. If that something more happens, something more. I'm asking how much more would settle you for good? If you understand that the only way you can settle this is, this does not want something more, it wants it all. If you want to have all, it can't be physical in nature. So if you realize this and if your experience of life transcends the limitations of the physical, now suddenly all is yours because it is the boundary which made you feel that you have to conquer that. Either you can conquer that or you can dissolve into it. Conquering the cosmos is a stupid idea, isn't it? Dissolving into the cosmos is a practical idea. So this is what yoga meant. If this happens in the inner experience of the human being, that you feel limitless within yourself, then you don't have to worry about what is the advertising message, consumerism. No, everybody will do what they think is needed. Nothing more, nothing less. Every human being should do what is needed for his individual life. Nothing more, nothing less. If you do less, that means you'll be inefficient. If you do more, the excess is also leading to inefficiency. You will not realize the full potential of who you are. So the intensity of experience comes within you only when you address the longing to expand. If you address the self-preservation mode, it will shut off everything. 
the only tears you will know is of pain, suffering, fear, agitation, frustration. But if you empower the other dimension of nature within you, one dimension of nature is trying to put a wall around yourself, another wants to go limitless. Only when you touch that, only when your life is carried by that dimension of nature within you, you will see every leaf, every flower, an ant can bring tears to you. I must tell you this. It's okay? <laughs> I had a great grandmother who… Uh, who people in those days said, she's a devil of a woman. <laughs> Not because she did any evil to anybody, it's just that if she laughed, the whole street would shake. Like that she laughed. In those days, women were not supposed to laugh loudly like that. I don't know how people manage to live without women who cannot laugh. It's, it must be tough <laughs> But she is a woman who when, he, when she laughed, everything around her shook. She lived up to 113, 113 years of age. When I met her, she was over hundred. So at the age of sixty-eight, she moved out of the family structure. By then she had buried her husband, she had buried her… many of her children, a few grandchildren, a few great-grandchildren also she had buried. She got married at the age of fourteen and over hundred years of age she had seen everybody through. So at the age of sixty-eight or seventy, she moved out of the family, she built a small place for herself and she grew her own food and she lived by herself. When we went there to the ancestral home in the summer vacation, she always came. And I kind of hit it off with her in a certain way because she was special. I did not know what was special about her, I was just four or five years of age. But uh, with her you could do anything you wanted, so I liked it <laughs> There were no rules with her <laughs> I would see her, somebody would bring breakfast for her, then she would go about giving this breakfast to the ants, to the sparrows, all the sparrows are dead now, to the sparrows and to the squirrels. Most of her breakfast would be gone like this and people around her, self-appointed advisors would say, you give away all your food to these creatures and you will die like this. All these advisors died but she lived on. <laughs> Many times I've seen her, she would just put this food to all these ants and the ants will be all eating. She would be just sitting there with tears streaking down her cheeks. And if somebody comes and reminds her, why don't you eat, she would say, I'm full. I thought she's really emotional about these ants. It took me another twenty-five years or twenty years to come to this experience where how if you're truly connected, you could be just nourished by anything and everything around you, it's not necessarily by consumption. So consumerism is not the way you connect with the existence, consumerism is not the way you experience life in its full depth and dimension. It is by inclusion that you know this. So right now, the, the most, what to say, rudimentary form of inclusion is to shop. <laughs> Shopping is the most… what is not yours, you make it yours <laughs> This seems to fulfill something for a moment, after some time it's once again the same thing. It is not a question of morality at all. This is a question of, am I here to somehow avoid life or am I here to experience and know life in its fullest depth and dimension. When I say life, at least this piece of life, if you cannot know the whole cosmos, it doesn't matter. Before you fall dead, at least this piece of life you must know in its entirety, otherwise you're a wasted life, isn't it? I, I, I think you might have questions on consumerism, but you can wait a little bit. I will not miss this opportunity on some other aspects of our business, which are not just about business, there are issues on life, um, which I want 
you too. That's one of the things that I keep hearing from very young people, 25, 20, 30 year old. I'm too stressed out. <laughs> now, Even the 12 year olds are saying. Sorry? 12 year olds are saying. Yeah. And uh, here also I've got a quote of yours. You found it. <laughs> Second one. <laughs> Stress is not in the job. Stress is your inability to manage your mind, emotions and life energies. Please tell me some nice way of communicating this to lots of young people in our business. I think lots of us would like to take that lesson and take it to the kids. So what one person feels as a great stress, another person breezes through the same situation, isn't it so? Today in the country, you look at the chaprasi, he's stressed because there's no promotion in the job. Okay. He wants to move from Bandra to Malabar Hill, promotion, sweeping a different street. <coughs> he's very stressed to sweep his patch of the street, not even the whole street. We can go like this, right the top job, the prime minister. In between, between the chaprasi and the prime minister, just about everybody including a school-going child is experiencing stress. Or in other words, what they are saying is the statement is, life is stress. <laughs> when I first went to United States a few years ago, wherever I went, people were talking about stress management. I could not understand <coughs> because in my perception, we will manage things which are precious to us. <laughs> uh, our family, our business, our wealth, our money, whatever else, whatever is precious to us. Why would anybody want to manage stress? This is something I couldn't figure, it took me some time <laughs> It took me some time to understand that these people have made a conclusion that stress is a part of their life. Stress is not a part of your life. As uh, the quote you read out said, if you knew how to keep your mind, for example, if your mind took instructions from you, if your mind just does whatever you want, would you keep it stressful or blissful? It's a question for all of you. <laughs> if your mind took instructions from you, would you keep it stressful or blissful? That's your choice. You must… you must make the choice. I'm going to bless you right now <laughs> It's very important you make the choice. The problem is most people have not made the choice. They have not made a clear choice. So if the mind was taking instructions, you would keep it blissful. Well, you have the answer. Your mind is not taking instructions from you. Then who is it taking instructions from? Maybe your company is influencing them. <laughs> Maybe somebody else, somebody else, just about anybody, just about anybody can mess up your mind. It doesn't take instructions from you, it is in a compulsive state of reaction. It is not in a conscious state of action, it is in a compulsive state of reaction. Because your mind doesn't take instructions from you, it feels like such a great threat even to have a mind that people are talking, you must become a no-mind <laughs> or slosh yourself with some chemical and be out for some time. All these things are simply because mind is… <coughs> mind is not working for you, it's working against you. Any kind of suffering, stressfulness, anxiety, anger, it doesn't matter what you call it, these are all different states of unpleasantness in your mind. Any kind of unpleasantness in your mind means your own intelligence is working against you. There is an evolutionary reason for this. You know, Charles Darwin told you, you are a monkey at one time. This is not my statement. No, I, I did not say that. Darwin told you, you were a monkey and then you became a man and all this stuff. We know evolutionary processes happen on this planet. For a goat to become a giraffe, it took so many million years. 
For a pig to become an elephant, it took many, many million years. But for a monkey to become a human being, it happened too quickly. Yes, to a point <laughs> Whenever he doesn't like something, he laughs it out <laughs> <laughs> it's better, it's better. Uh, <clears throat> to a point where the anthropologists of the day are saying there is a missing link somewhere because there are some jumps which are not logical, they have happened too rapidly. There are many reasons, I will not go into the scientific reasons why it happened so rapidly. There are good scientific reasons as to why it, pr it just kind of picked up so much momentum, the evolutionary process. But now what's happened is, we have an intelligence for which we don't have an appropriate platform. <coughs> Unless you create a proper platform, your intelligence will torment you. Right now, human beings are suffering their own intelligence. When you have a mind of this kind of breadth and capability, every human being has, they kind of restrict it because the fear of suffering. They think if their mind functions freely, so much suffering it will bring, stress, anxiety, fear, all kinds of things. A stable base is what is missing. The spiritual processes, particularly the yogic practices, when, you, when I say yoga, do not think of impossible postures, there are various things to create a stable base, a kind of base which can hold this intelligence with ease. If you do not do that, in the evolution of intelligence from monkey to man and in the evolution of the body from monkey to man, there is… they have happened at different speeds. The evolution of the mind and consciousness has gone too rapidly, the body has not gone so rapidly. So because of this, there is a little bit of thing, you have to do something with this. You have to bring a certain balance and stability into your system for you to enjoy this intelligence. Otherwise, this intelligence will turn against you and torment you in a million different ways. And that's what is happening, which we are today calling a stress. People are saying, my job is stress. Okay, I'll have you fired. Will you walk happily on the beach? <laughs> no, you'll be depressed. If I give you a job, you'll be manic. If you lose a job, you'll be depressed. <laughs> People are trying to bring stability into their life by making conclusions on everything. You have to become something. You have to become an optimist, you have to become a pessimist, you have to become a theist or an atheist or you become a Hindu or a Muslim or whatever. You have to become something to become stable because this is identity-based stability. The moment you identify yourself with something, whatever it may be, the moment you identify yourself with something, your mind will function only around that whatever you're identified with. Once mind is functioning only around that, it becomes like a whirlpool of its own. If you watched in a river, a river is moving rapidly towards the ocean, there will be a whirlpool here. This whirlpool goes nowhere, it is always in the same place. This is the nature of the whirlpool. So the moment you identify yourself with something that you are not, when I say something that you are not, the very physical body that you carry is an accumulated body, isn't it? It is… it is a piece of the planet that you gathered slowly over a period of time. You must get this now. If you don't get this now from me, one day you'll get it from the maggots and that's not of much use. Right now, you know that this is just a piece of the planet that you picked up. If you get identified with this, your mind functions only around this. This body is everything. Because this body is everything, whatever concerns this body, all those bodies become something. This is the bane of our country right now. This is a Dhritarashtra syndrome. You remember? So basically what you're saying is um, that it is… you have to take things as they exist but you have to use your imagination no, 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 to… No, no, no. This is what I'm saying. Don't draw a conclusion. Conclusion is death, isn't it? Awareness is life. 
I am an optimist means tomorrow is going to be a great day. Pessimist means tomorrow there may be a lot of trouble, tomorrow this may happen, that may happen. But you, the reality is tomorrow has not come so you don't know what the hell it's going to be. We will plan for tomorrow but you really don't know what it is, isn't it? Yes or no? It doesn't matter how many predictions you have, how much guesswork you have, still you do not know what tomorrow is. You Actually, you do not know what next five minutes is, isn't it? So reality of life is just this. We have a whole lot of ideas based on the past experience of life. They may go well in a few times, but there's always a possibility something else could happen, always. That is the reality of life. If you make a conclusion that this is the way it's going to be, you miss the experience of life because you concluded. All these conclusions are because one way or the other we want to take away the uncertainty of life. We want to conclude. People want to conclude there is God, there is no God, there is like this, like that. Atheists and theists are just people who neither have the courage nor the commitment to seek what is true. So this is why you must understand in this land, the fundamental ethos of this culture has been that this is a land of seekers, never a land of believers. In the same family, five people can worship five different gods because we have understood the technology of God-making. Yes, yes, we know how to create forms which will work for us and we know very well we created it. And there is a certain process called Ishta Devata, that means you can choose your god of your liking. There are thirty-three million gods and goddesses, you have a choice, but if you don't like any of them, you can make your own, really. If you worship the tree in your garden, nobody in India thinks you've gone crazy, okay? Somewhere else they'll report you, yes? It is… it is so. You worship a small rock on the street side, nobody thinks you're crazy, okay, you relate to that, it's fine with me. You worship the clouds in the sky, perfectly fine. Because whatever you relate to, you make it your God because anyway we know you made it up. We are conscious that we made it up. Some people have lost that awareness that they made it up. Yes? And this is very important. Does it mean to say there is nothing beyond us? Well. Before we came here, the planet was here, the cosmos was here, after we are dead, it'll be here. So obviously we didn't make it, nor are we running it. Definitely there is something bigger than us, but not the way we imagine because this imagination is coming from a certain obnoxiousness that the cosmos is human-centric. The cosmos is not human-centric. We are just a small happening in this creation. We also have a place, but the, the world and the existence is not centered around us. This is a very obnoxious conclusion we have made. Because of these kind of conclusions, we become this or that. Why is it so necessary to make a conclusion? Because our well-being is not coming from our awareness, our well-being is coming from conclusions that we have made. It gives us a certain sense of certainty that I belong to this party or that party. I am willing to look every moment and see which is the best thing to do right now. No, 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 that seems too uncertain. But whatever you do, whatever arrangements you make, whatever conclusions you make, reality will get you the way it gets you, all right? Yes or no? <laughs> It'll anyway get you, one way or the other. If you are in touch with reality, if you are in tune with reality, you can handle these things gracefully. Life and death, you can handle gracefully. Otherwise, if you are an optimist, you will go towards till as long as a few things are working, you're okay. After that, you will be frustrated. <laughs> if you're a pessimist, we don't have to tell you. You've already given up on everything. Is it true? that your body, when you were born, it was only this much and slowly you gathered it. Is it true? Why is it so difficult to say yes? 
yes. So you gathered this body. What you call as your mind is… this is an accumulation of the food that you've eaten. What you call as your mind is an accumulation of the impressions that you have taken in from whatever exposures you have in the world. So your body is an accumulation, your mind is an accumulation. Whatever you accumulate, at the most you can claim it is mine. If you say it is me, it amounts to insanity. Suppose I suddenly pick up this vessel and say, this is my vessel, uh, they will think, oh, he's… Sadhguru's got some problem with the vessel. But everybody says he's wise, let's listen some more. After some time I say, this is me, then you will say, let's go. <laughs> this unfortunately you're doing every day. The food that you eat appears on your plate, you say, this is my food, you eat it and say, this is me. This is a socially accepted level of insanity, okay? Yes, it's socially accepted, but if you believe something that is not you as yourself, it amounts to insanity, isn't it? Even medically, you will qualify. Now, consumerism or becoming a consumerist, there is no such thing. You must only consume what you can digest, not only physically, in every other way. If you consume more than what you can handle, it will only lead to destruction. This you know very well with your body, but that is the same thing with… true with everything. So this consumerism means instead of human consciousness directing the human commerce activity, Right now we are letting commerce direct human consciousness. This is a dangerous way to live and it is definitely not a sustainable way to live. I am not only saying ecologically, even as human beings, we will not be able to sustain our basic human nature if we go this way for too long. Right now a few people are trying to push, but you must understand a whole lot of people, I am sure it is true in this hall and everywhere, the moment the advertisements come, they switch it off and go and attend to their this and that. <laughs> yes? A few things they may watch, rest of it people will try to avoid because it is… it has become a certain onslaught of you must do this, you must do that. It is only initially it is working, after that people will only see what they want to see, what they need. They are not going to watch everything and get excited about it. That's not true. That is only true with a certain juvenile mind. Everybody else will see only what they want to see. You're advertising Rolls Royce, a whole lot of people may see, okay, it's a beautiful car, but they never think, I must get a Rolls Royce. A whole lot of people will not think. There are very few people, a certain segment of people who will drool, oh, I wish I had it. Not everybody else. A whole lot of people think it's an Im impractical car to buy. They'll buy something else, what is suitable for their life and their lifestyle and everything else. So what I'm saying is, this thing about somebody is a consumerist, somebody is a spiritual person, there is no such thing. What you have right now as a body and mind, both accumulated. If you accumulated all this, what you accumulate cannot be you, isn't it? By any standards, what you accumulate at the most can be yours, it cannot be you. So if you accumulate this much body and this much mind, there must be something more fundamental about you which is beyond this body and this mind. If you touch that, we say you're spiritual. Once you're spiritual, your consumption becomes conscious. Do what you don't do, I think you must look at yourself very carefully because the children are picking up everything rapidly and they'll exaggerate everything that you're doing. <laughs> so, one foremost thing is, at least make yourself in such a way that you would like to be. Somebody may not approve, it doesn't matter. At least you made yourself in such a way that you like the way you are. Gurus 
No, women will not make good gurus, nor will men make good gurus. Unless you know how to be beyond the two, you can't be this. If you're a man or a woman, if you're stuck with your gender, then there's no chance of being a guru because you're looking at the mechanics of life in a completely different way. You're just looking at life as life. All the problems on the planet is simply because everybody has their own mission. And these missions are creating variety of conflict. If all of us sit here without any mission, mission means an assumed position of importance and agenda, individual agenda. If all of us can sit here, what is a human being longing for, every human being? All of you, wherever you are right now, you would like to be little more than what you're right now, isn't it so? Hello? Yes. If that little more happens, what? Little more? If that happens, what? So it looks like in installments you're going towards something. How much more would settle you for good? Let's look at it right now. If your stomach is empty, there's only one issue about food. But once the stomach becomes full, you have a hundred issues going on. <laughs> so the nature of the human being is such, no matter what you do, you want to be something more than what you are right now. And if that something more ha happens, something more, something more, it's an endless pursuit. So somewhere a human being is seeking a limitless expansion, but trying to do it with physical… Education uh, in its true sense is essentially a tool to expand human perception, if possible consciousness. But today the societies have chosen to, edu to use education only as a tool to produce cogs for the larger machine. Whatever happens to the planet naturally happens to this body because this body is a product of the way this planet and this solar system is functioning. This is like the potter's wheel by which this has been made. He went into an elaborate science of this later but to make it very simple, this much is clear to all of us, there's an, there's an elaborate science and mathematic involved in this. But leaving that aside, the way it works, doing something right means doing it the way it works, isn't it? And it's very important, whatever we do, we do it the way it works. Can I t I'm getting very serious. <laughs> On a certain day, a man fell into the septic tank. I want all of you to visualize yourself <laughs> in a septic tank. He desperately tried to come out. He could not. Then he started screaming, fire, fire. 